Many of you, like me, you're saying, okay, God, it's time for you to do in this nation what you're doing in those nations. You're no respecter of the nations. And I believe that he is, and uh, we can trust him. I know these are days with things happening such as what happened this week, the mandates of government, of which are unconstitutional, illegal, immoral, and ungodly. And if I could think of some other adjectives, I will think of them. But it's released great confusion. There's a great, you know, total disregard for the law, for justice, and for the Constitution. You remember when Bobby told us there was a gate of hell open when Speaker Pelosi, after one of the speeches by our President Trump, remember she on, made sure she was on camera. She ripped that speech in two with smugness and pride and arrogance. And Bobby told us that that was the moment that the gate of hell was open and a flood of darkness flooded into the land. Well, that's why we're here, and that's what we're going to talk about. I've been reading this book do not live by lies or live not by lies. And I've shared some things from that book from time to time. It's one of those books you don't want to read, you know, just before you go to sleep. And that's when most of the time I would read it. And, um, but anyway, this week, I, or was it? Yeah, it's this week. I, I, I lacked the last chapter or two. I read an, a lot and and there's a lot of information, and, uh, but anyway, I said, you must finish. You must finish. You ever been there? You must finish this. You begin. I'm glad God finishes what he began in us. No one has to prod him. He's not going to forget. But anyway, I ran across a statement in one of the final chapters by the author. He said this, no Christian has the power to avoid suffering entirely. It is the human condition. What we do control is how we act in the face of it. Will we run from it and betray our Lord? Or will we accept it as a severe mercy? The choices we make when put to the ultimate test depend on the choices we make today. Earlier this morning, you know, in the wake-up zone in the midst of waking up, I heard the Lord, and he said, remind my people two things. Number one, he said that I never change. You tell them, you remind them, I never change. Secondly, Jesus is the same. You say, God never changes. And secondly, Jesus is the same. He's the same yesterday, same today, and Forever, doesn't matter what we go through, doesn't matter what we face. Now, you know that much of what we're facing, first of all, is a spiritual battle, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. How many of you are ready for this? Powers, principalities, rulers, and all of these things. But then it's played out in the natural. Would you give, hey, Michael, can you come share with us about your grandfather? Just bring him the mic about your grandfather. Then I want to bounce off off of that. But I want you to know why about this testimony of his grandfather and I believe your uncle and what we're called to do in light of it. In 2007, uh, I received a gift from my aunt who had been in Germany twice a year for the past decade or two, gathering our family tree. And I came to study the material she gifted me with and found out that my grandfather and great uncle were sent here by Adolf Hitler in 1924 
to establish a socialist mindset in the American people. And by the mid-30s, they had successfully infiltrated every state in the continental United States with a Bund, a German-American Bund, which was a teaching propaganda school. They headed up Hitler's propaganda ministry in all of southern Bavaria, so they knew how to change people's minds. They set the Bunds in every continental 48 states in America, and by the late 30s, the United States government had become so fearful of a takeover by Hitler that they subpoenaed my grandfather. He testified 17 times before the House of Un-American Acts, and it began a dismantling of the almost takeover, and that was in the late 30s. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. But how many of you know they didn't give up? Do you remember when our president... Obama said, this is something we've been waiting for for 50 years. They believed they had achieved their goals. And then God threw a wrench in their armor, and he raised up a man that they hated with a passion. And God gave us a stay, gave us a grace, a grace period of four years. Now, they're not holding back in this hour. They have revved it up. They believe. I have a, well, he's not a friend. He's just an acquaintance. But understand, these guys operate in deliverance. And they said today when you're casting out demons, the demons have become very cocky. And they come out of people. They still come out at the name of Jesus. But they come out bragging and boastful that our Messiah has arrived and this is our hour. We have won. And they are boasting. So my question is, what are we going to do about it? You know, there's the sovereignty of God. Thank God, right? Say, thank God. That's when God just intervenes. You weren't looking for it. Maybe you were. But God supernaturally showed himself strong. But then there's also the responsibility of man. Say, responsibility of man. Now listen, we can't do what only God can do, but God won't do what he's called us and commanded and anointed us to do. Did you hear that? We can't do what only God can do, but God won't do what he's called and commanded and anointed us to do. And you know, I believe God gave us the Constitution, and it's We are as the stewards. You can bow to illegal mandates or you can stand one or the other. God will back you up. Truth is greater than falsehood. And God is a God of truth. I'm just going to... I know many right now, school boards, you know, uh, businesses... City councils, legislators, government, you know, all over the nation have been tossed into a season of confusion. That's by design, and the enemy wants to see how you respond. The doors of freedom are barely open. There are champions all over our nation that if you do not stand in this hour, your children will grow up under what his grandfather came to bring. It is time to stand as Americans and stand as believers. And I want to show you something. That's what a little bit this is about. Then I'm going to shift gears because of something that happened Friday night and uh, really over the last couple of weeks. But let me just remind you of something in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. And this is what we can expect in this hour. In verse 11 it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Or he who is wicked, let him be wicked still. And we've looked at that before. The wicked are going to double down on their wickedness. Correct? So how do we respond? 
Well, the next part, I believe that this was placed in the Scripture exactly as the Holy Spirit wanted it to be placed. But let the righteous be righteous still. He who is righteous, let him be. Let him do right. Righteousness is who we are, but it's what we do. Say, it's what I do. And who is holy, let him be holy still. So in the midst of wickedness, what do we do? Righteousness. We don't compromise with the wickedness. Now I'll give you another thing that God... This all happened this morning. Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. You remember this verse. And we always quote Daniel eleven thirty two 32 in the second part. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. How many of you believe that's true? How many of you believe you're going to be in on it? Well, what's the context? Well, you got to read in verse 31. And the forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. And then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But, there's the but. Thank God for this but. Thank you, Jesus. But the people who God, who know their God shall be strong. Verse 33, and those of the people who understand shall instruct many. God's raising up instructors right now. I'm just going to tell you, I know a number in pulpits that are caving by the moment. And I know many of them. And it mind boggles. It's mind boggling. And they are preaching a ear tickling sound. But I'm telling you, God is raising up those who will instruct in this hour all over the land. But then you have to read the rest of the story because since I didn't write it, I have to read it. If I could rewrite it, you know. They shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame and by captivity and by plundering. And you can go on. And verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall. What? To destroy them? No. What does it say? To refine them, purify them. And make them white until the time of the end, because it is still an appointed time. And it's not going to happen before God says it's time. Do you understand that? Are we with you? Are you with me? Now here, let me tie this up to where we're going this morning. Some of you are saying, I hope we're going somewhere other than where you're going. I just want to go where he takes me. I want to follow the Lamb. It's, I did not write the story, therefore I cannot tell the story as I would like to tell it. I can only tell the story as he has written it and as he has commanded it. You don't make up your own thing here. But Jesus said in John 9, 4 through 5, you don't have to turn, this, uh, turn to that. I'll just, he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Because night is coming when what? No man will get to work. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I am what? I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then we see a transition. Look over in Matthew. And if you don't have a physical copy, you know, I was thinking, we're sending Bibles or money to buy Bibles to the nations. We probably should buy some folks Bibles in America. Because many people have, what if they turn your internet off? You might want to get a hard copy. I'm just telling you, you're going to need God's Word in this hour. Because I have a feeling a lot of people have not hidden much of His Word in their heart. And so when the time and the pressure comes, what are you going to stand on? Your own emotions? Your own intellect? Your own opinions? Somebody else's opinion? No, you're going to have to stand on the Word of God. And not just what God has spoken to somebody else, but what He's spoken to you. You, you must know God's Word. But anyway, there's a shift here from Jesus to look at this. Matthew 5, verse 13. You, say I, because he's talking to us. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
It is then good for nothing. Now, Jesus, this, these are words in red. But to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Can I tell you, all of these that Jesus is referring to are standing by right now to do what they've been called to do. I didn't get any amens. You are the light of the world. At a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket and put on a lamp, uh, but put it on a lampstand, and he gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before what? Men, Men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I had announced last week, David, it's so good to see you. He's a friend. You know, we love you. This is a mighty man of God standing for truth all alone. He doesn't need a crowd to encourage him on. He's just standing, paying the price every day. But that's who we are. We're to be. It's it's our testimony. Someone said it's one thing, looking at this verse, to be a candle during the day. But now it's time to be a candle in the night. I announced to you last week that we were going to continue in the theme, the saints of the revelation, of which, now they may mock me and laugh at me, but I believe it's going to be proven one day that that's exactly who we were. And because I've just found this is the way God has moved in my 35 plus ministry years, whatever preaching, he always gives me what he's doing what is unfolding, this is one of the times I almost wish that wasn't true. No, not almost. I wish it wasn't true. Sometimes, some people get to preach him what God said. That's okay. He's the God who was. Some people, they're caught up in who God is going to be one day. And that's all they talk about. And they just want you to live. And this is all, it's not for you. This is for some day. So you don't have to worry about it. God made me the kind I'm supposed to tell people what you're to do today. He's the God who is. Now, I'm all for yesterday and I'm all for tomorrow. We need all three. But we need to hear, because man's not going to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Michael reminded us last night or last Friday night. You know, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And he reminded us, but you look around, you see the gates of hell prevailing. Something is going to rise. Something is wrong. Well, I would suggest that what Jesus said is exactly true. The problem is men have been building their own churches. But the church he's building, the gates of hell will, it'll be proven, will not have prevailed. And God's going to shake right now everything that man has built that even now are tickling the ears of the masses. And he's going to build a church that loves his word alone. And that church will stand because it's standing upon a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now in this hour, we cannot let our voice grow faint. We cannot become silent Shirley brought a scripture to me this morning as I'm drinking my coffee. I couldn't eat any oatmeal as I normally do because we're in the midst of a 21-day fast, and you guys should be joining us. And if you're not, join me now. It's kind of these, I'm doing some days all the day, nothing. Other days, one meal a day. Today's one meal a day because I'm taking Michael to lunch. I'm going to eat a lot at lunch. And uh, I'll just tell you, that's how I feel. And then this week, we'll figure out a couple days of no day, none, and then toward the end of the 21, we'll do that. Because we're doing this during the feast. Yom Kippur, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, and then Tabernacles. This is an amazing prophetic time. And so it's a great time to be fasting and praying. And uh, because it's not your normal time, <clears throat> but we must speak up. Now, Jim Elliott, how many of you heard of Jim Elliott? That's all. 
I'm going to tell you about him. You need to know who he was. He was in his 20s. He had a dream of sharing the gospel to the unreached people groups. So he and his friends go down to Ecuador, and they somehow figure out a way to put out food, and they land on this little uh, sandbar. But anyway, or they don't land on the sandbar, but they get to the sandbar. But anyway, they're speared to death by those they're bringing the gospel. They're trying to bring the gospel to. But in his journal, years later, they read what he said. He said in his journal, he said, Lord, fill preachers and preaching with power. How long dare we go on without tears, without moral purity, hatred, and love? Not long, I pray. Lord Jesus, not long, I pray. And I pray that Jim Elliott's prayers will be heard. Now, go to Revelation chapter 2. I, I said we're not going to continue in that particular theme, the saints of the Revelation. But I am going to jump into and then off of a scripture out of Revelation that uh, fits with the hour. And then I want to just really seal what's been spoken in this, from this pulpit Friday night was the most incredible word. And then last Sunday, Chris Reed spoke an incredible word, timely. But then at the end, he spoke a number of things over us. And then Friday night, Stephen Francis, he spoke incredible word of the Lord, timely, Now, you're not supposed to just be hearers only. You're supposed to be doers. And so I want to do. I want to walk in. This gives me great hope. God's going to have a people. He's going to have a remnant. He's going to have, there are going to be Goshen's where God's going to protect the people because his will is going to be done on the earth. And I want to be one of them, and I want you to be one of them. So we're going to... Establish what's been spoken. But anyway, the last time, two weeks ago, we spoke out of Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Now today, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Stand up. Let's read these scriptures. Just stand with me in honor of the word. I'm going to read other scriptures. You won't have to stand, but I just I wanted to honor the word of God. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What are you to do as a lampstand? Let your light so shine, right? You don't hide under a bushel. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And you've found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience. And you've labored for my name's sake. And you've not become weary. Now, how many of you know there's been a temptation to become weary? Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. And we're not going to go into that aspect this morning. But remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Say first works. Or else I will come to you quickly And I will remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. How many of you know there are things that God hates? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches in America. I can insert that. To him who overcomes... I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Lord, I pray that you would help me to deliver your word. Lord, there's some things that you will do without any help from men. There are other things you've commanded us to do. And you've given us the anointing and the unction and the grace to do it. And we thank you, Lord. Help us now to deliver and to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I don't want to pass over 
really quickly just the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Because what are these deeds? What were they doing that drew such hatred from the Lord and from God's people? Well, they're really compared to what was happening in the church of Thyatira. In order to keep their jobs, remember? They had to comply. They had to give in. They had to compromise their faith. In order to keep their jobs, they had to join in with the idol worship of the patron deity of that particular manufacturing, remember, organization, union. It's a trade guild of the Romans. And they had a choice. They could cave in. They, now, this was much more serious. They, they had sexual immorality. There was sacrifices. They ate food offered to idols. But there was a, and so the Nicolaitans are those who caved. Say they caved. In other words, they were not those who overcame by not loving their lives even unto death. There were those who did overcome because they loved not their lives unto death. Because they knew they were under the lamb, under the blood of the lamb. And so their testimony was that they would serve him whether they live or they die. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. They did not want to be ashamed in anything, but with all boldness, Christ as even now was to be exalted in them, whether by life or by death. That was the Nicolaitans. So here's how you sum it up. They were compliant, they were compromised, and they were cowards. And that's why the cowards are among the first who will be thrown into the lake of fire. Because in the time they had, the testimony that they would have had by standing, they sacrificed it. And they denied the Lord who had given himself for them. And they refused to give themselves for him. Now, I'm just reading. Now, let's go to the rest of this. When Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, repent or do the first works, Think about the first works, first works in the scripture. What does that mean, first works? Remember they said, what must we do to do the works of of him? And Jesus said, believe. What do you want to, you want to know to do the, the works? Then believe on him whom the Father sent, right? So we believe in Jesus initially for salvation, but then do you stop believing in him? You believe him continually. You come unto him continually. And you believe those whom God sends. I think that is all through church history. There is, as Michael shared the other night, the sent ones, and then there are the went ones. And we've already determined we don't want to be the went ones. We want to be the sent ones. The went ones will not stand in this hour. The heat will be too great. The winds will be too strong. The resistance will be too much for them to handle. But the sent ones will have all authority. They will walk into this world having been sent. And Jesus, they'll remember, Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Did you hear what I said? Then first work, we... I thought about, you know, well, another first thing is we're to love the Lord our God. First, what's the first and great commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Ephesians or Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom. First the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be at all these things. Can you be trusted? You think God can be trusted? If we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, which is more than some state of being. It is a state of being made righteous by his blood, but it's doing righteous in following him in obedience, right? It's an act that God will be faithful. And then Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship prepared for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So that's a first work. God prepared something for my life before I was even born 
that I would walk in. How many of you know that's true? So we get to walk it out as we hear him. We didn't come up with it. It's been written. So we are fulfilling the mandate of heaven for our lives. We're doing what we were made for. And likewise, the church in these days is going to return to doing what it was made for. Does that make sense? That's what Michael, that's why he was here. And he imparted something Friday. And and Chris Reed's going to hang around with us. He told me he really felt connected with us. Really, 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 really. So he wants to come back. I said, man, you can come any time. I like these young guys coming. I like many coming. I don't want to be the only voice. Because to much is given, much is required. I don't want to speak anything unless God gives me something to say. I want to hear. I'm a disciple. I'm a learner. I want to hear. And then when he says speak, I want to speak. I had a teacher said, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Well, it's the same way now. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. But then you better speak because you'll be held accountable. Now, what was the church built upon? I don't know. How, I'm going to get through this because I've got to get to something. Look at Ephesians real quick. Ephesians chapter 2. God's bringing us back to the first works. So we need to speak this and release this regardless of what's going on. I'm trusting God. Nothing's going to happen before it's appointed time. You and I have been called to send upheaval into the courts of hell that are seeking to bring upheaval. By doing the will of God, obeying God, we are sending shockwaves into hell. Hell should have our pictures up on their bulletin boards. And there should be an alert going off in hell because... God's sons and daughters are rising to be who they've been called to be and do what they've been called to do. This is the church. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built, and here it is, on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and then the whole body is fit together, built together. So we see the church was built on the apostles and the prophets, Jesus himself, being apostle, being the chief apostle, being a prophet, being the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, but he has raised up those who will occupy those positions, but it's built on the apostles and prophets. Now, if the church began on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, how many of you think it just might end in the same way that it began. And I heard from Friday night, I heard last Friday night, and I heard last Sunday, all three of those men kept speaking about the apostolic calling upon our lives. Now, we can do one of two things. You can be, you can say, well, I'm really humble. That's too much for me. So I'm just going to take the low road. Or You can just walk out what God spoke about you. How many of you know that's a better thing to do? Because your humility is not that impressive to God. True humility is saying, yes, God, this is what you say, so this is what I will do. Regardless of what they call you, and they will call you in this hour much. If I let that scare me away, we would have gone a long time ago. (laughs) <laughs> Let me tell you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, this is where I wanted to get. So maybe, I don't know who's going to listen, when it will be heard, but I know that his word does not return void, and I know that his word runs swiftly. And I pray that this morning, the word of God would run swiftly through the land through the nation and the nations of the earth, because all of those men spoke about how we were to influence nations. So we don't have to apologize to anybody. I'd rather look foolish in the sight of men than foolish in the sight of God. I want to be 
his son. I want him to say, well done. You will not get a well done by backing off of what you've been called to do. You get well done by doing, you did it well done. You did it. Now, you may not think it was well done, and you need a lot of grace. Well, guess what? We have a lot of grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, the title of this message that I'm going to try to preach in about 20, 25 minutes. It never works when I say that, but I'm going to do my best. Maybe less. You might be shocked. I may be able to blitz through this. Because we get to go to lunch. But that has nothing to do with anything. I, I do find on those days that I fast, on, I eat one meal, I'm looking forward to the meal. And I'm looking at the clock. The days I'm not going to eat, don't look at the clock because it goes too slow. They ought to call this a slow instead of a fast. You get into third or fourth day, you know, you look, man, these days are slow. What is this turtle day? You know, and I'm not making fun because I know there'll be more. I'm staying the journey. This week I'm going to get away on the Day of Atonement. Like Bobby does. Like Bob used to do. I feel like the Lord said, no, you get away this time. So I'm going to get away. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God has to say on this Day of Atonement. Anyway. Okay, now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. So Paul is talking about his apostleship. He says, I'm not, he said, I'm the least. He didn't say, I'm not. He said, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle I, because what he did, he persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Say that. So Paul is boasting in the grace of God, but he's not surrendering his own responsibility. There's the sovereignty of God, but the responsibility that he has. He said, but I've labored more abundantly than they all. And yet even in my labor, it was not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And then he goes on and declares all these things. Now, beginning in verse 12, we see specific aspects of the apostolic gospel, which really defines who we are. Say who we are. What we're going to do. Say what we're going to do. And our message. Here's what I'm going to go back and look at all that in a moment. Instead of reading it all, we'll just go back and skip through it. But we want to hit each point because the apostolic gospel, the apostolic ministry defines who the church is going to be at the end of the age. It's because how we begin. We're going to need the prophetic and the apostolic. While we're doing the evangelistic, we're teaching, we're doing these things. Oh, by the way, before I get into this, these, I took good notes Friday night. This is what Michael told us. Keys to apostolic hubs or reformation centers. You better be what you're called to be if you want to be protected. You know how some people claim that verse? Well, if I just drink any deadly thing, the Bible says nothing will harm me, so I'm just going to let, them, let it happen. You know that's taking that scripture out of context. You can't just claim that verse in Mark 16. You only get to claim that verse in Mark 16 if you're doing what Mark 16 says you're to do. Go, ye therefore. You're going and you're doing. You're a sent one under the command of God, doing the will of God, irregardless of the mandates of men. Did you hear what I said? And if you're doing the will of God, then you will take up these demonic, cast them down, whatever they try to do to you, nothing will by any means harm you because you're following the will of the Lord. Because what are you going to do when they force this thing? I said I wasn't going to go there, but you know the Scripture says, and they caused all. Cause means force. All, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive the mark. Now again, Is this the mark? No, we said last week, 
It's in the same ball game. And the decisions you make today, I promise you, you will make tomorrow. They will follow you. The sooner you stand, the far better. You're going to die anyway. Can I have a little fun? They think they're going to live forever, some of those guys, the elite. I'm not going to get into it, but it's really the disgusting aspect between the sex trafficking, child sacrifice things that the elite are doing. And they will stand before a holy God one day, blood all over their hands. But anyway, don't get off into that. But you know, they want to live forever. There's a people out there that think they're going to live forever. So they want to do what they're off. Anyway, I had heard this in, and I'd seen this in science fiction movies. I know it's real. I looked. Rodney Howard Brown tweeted something yesterday. And here's what he tweeted. In a laboratory in Russia, somebody broke in and stole the brains and the bodies that were frozen. I thought about the movie I'd seen one time, Young Frankenstein. I thought, God, I thought that was a movie. You mean it's real. And so I looked on the website that Rodney tweeted about. And there is a company that the elite, if you got the money now, it ain't going to happen on your paycheck or mine. But you can go have your body frozen. And then later on when science comes up with some cure to whatever disease you had, they'll unfreeze you. You'll come alive and they'll have the antidote ready to insert in your body and you'll be whole and well and live forever. Can I just inform you about something? <laughs> the foolishness, you know, the f- utter foolishness of man. It is appointed man wants to die, and then the judgment. You are not going to escape the judgments of God. It's best to be prepared, to be ready. You don't have to be, you don't have to be judged. There is an antidote. And his name is Jesus. All right, I was going to read this. Keys to apostolic hubs. Come to Jesus as a student. How many of you are students? I'm one of them. You find somebody that knows it all, don't go to that person because they don't know very much at all. We are disciples. We are students. We have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. you got to hear what the Spirit is saying, especially in the last hour. You can't trust what you've done or what who is saying what. Secondly, immerse the nations in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, I understood. And then raise up a sent one generation and go turn the world upside down. You come to this church, you have a mission. Leave and go turn the world upside down. Spoil the works of the devil. He's a liar. He's a father of the lies. And then we're to continue in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, prayers, those things we had read, we knew, but that we would be a part of a great transformation, great revival. Anybody still think that's possible? I know, I know many that have given up. Not me. Because I'm telling you, I read in the midst of gross darkness. But anyway, a, an apostolic means a sent one. Say a sent one. It defines who we are, our walk, our devotion, our time, our life. It's to walk in the ways of Jesus. That's what the early apostles, I mean, it's really not that complicated. You hear that word and you think it's very complicated. It's very simple. You just walk as a disciple of Jesus. Oswald Chambers said, we have a tendency to forget that a person is not only committed to Jesus for salvation, but is also committed, responsible, and accountable to Jesus 
in his views of God, his views of the world, his views of sin, and his view of the devil. Every view that he has, we are responsible. It's not our worldview. It's his worldview. We are to bring his worldview onto the earth and thus release the gospel, the good news throughout the earth. Does that sound possible? The New Testament church did not have the luxury to pick and choose what they wanted to believe or only to proclaim what meets their fancy. Their life was not their own. They not only to, were to be born of the Spirit, they were to have their minds renewed by the Word of God. So apostolic, two great commands. Anybody remember? You remember the two great commands David, Jesus gave us? Number one, what? Come unto me. Number two, go. So, if, so we come because we're going to be heavy laden and we need to keep coming. Cast all our cares. That's true humility. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. But then go. Whatever he's called you to do. Not just be a a bystander, but a participant. Does that make sense? So the apostolic defines where we came from, who we are, our message, especially our message at the end of the age. Does that make sense? Now here's where I'll go quickly. But I really believe this is what God is saying. I text Bonnie, and I haven't heard from her yet. But I remember, maybe some of you, maybe somebody watching, Bob Jones gave a prophetic word. He said that when you see the Mississippi River flow backwards, something was going to happen. I can't remember what the something was, so we'll look it up so we won't just, you know, hit. or We don't want to miss. We want to hit it. But you know what just happened? The Mississippi River River flowed backwards during Hurricane Ida. I didn't know that until this week, and a friend of mine informed me, and I said, no. Yes, he said, yes. I said, no. Yes, no. (laughs) No, I'm thinking about, that means a lot. No. No, yes, look it up. I looked it up. It did. So anyway, maybe this just bears witness with something else Bob said. Since he lies right over there, we need to, from time to time, quote what he said. You might appreciate it, although he's not out there. It's just his bones. But anyway, he's in that great cloud of witnesses. We have a balcony in this room, and the over, I'm telling you, it may not be down here, but up there in the, in the bleacher section, it is overflowing with a great cloud of witnesses that are rooting us on and calling us to fulfill what God's called us to fulfill, because they're waiting. They're rooting us on, and Bob's up in the crowd this morning. It's good to see you, Bob. I'm glad. You know that. Now, I didn't literally see him, but I'm seeing him in the spirit. But anyway, here's something else he said. It's, I'm just fooling around. But it's okay to fool around some. You're going to have to fool around in this hour. You take everything too serious, you'll go crazy. So have fun. Even if the end comes, joke around. Remember Fred Sanford used to joke around? He'd say, Elizabeth, honey, I'm coming to join you. Now just enjoy life. Don't... Don't give them, don't give them the, don't give them any joy by your sorrow. You have joy. And I promise you, their day, they will be made sorrowful. Our God is a God of vengeance. And he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. There are things that are going to happen. That we read were going to happen. We just didn't believe it. It was another place, another time, another people, another galaxy far, far away. No. But here's what Bob said. He said, it's not out with the old and in with the new. Have you noticed today in modern Christianity, 
Everyone wants to go with what is brand new. And as long as it's new, they're there. But then when, the, when it begins, the gold rubs off, then they go looking. They were never sent. If they had been of you, they would have remained with you. But because they went, they proved they were never of you. That's what the Bible says. I have no choice. I cannot form my own opinion. You go where he sends. He places in the body those whom he places for his purposes. And especially in this hour, you've been called into the kingdom. But anyway, Bob said it's not out with the old and in with the new. But it's out with the old and in with even that which is much older. And that's where the church is going to be rooted and grounded in the days to come. You got it? Okay, I'm going to skip through really quickly, but look at this. In verse 12, here's some, uh, what do you call them? Keys, points to make you feel good. No, that's what they, you know, a lot of mess. Here are the 12 steps to feeling good about yourself. No, that's not our message. Number, number one, though, but here's some things that we need to understand about the apostolic gospel. Number one, verse 12, now if Christ is preached. And the key is, if Christ is preached. That's a question today in much of the church. Is Christ being preached? General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, he said there was, he prophetically said there's a day coming when you will see And he said this over 100 years ago. He said, there's a day coming where there will be Christianity without Christ. Well, I would say to you, there is no such of a thing as Christianity without Christ. It's a false gospel. St. Patrick, you know that prayer. This This should be our prayer. You should look it up and pray this. When you begin your day, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. It's Christ in me. It's Christ It's Jesus. That's what we're all about. We're disciples of him. We never were called to follow a man. We're called to follow the king of glory. You follow the king. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. That's going to be the mark of the last day church. And you read Galatians. We won't go there. But, you know, there were those who said, we're of the sons of Abraham. Because they were of the lineage. You remember that? Jesus said, he's trying to gain their approval. He said, yeah, if you, if you were of your father, Abraham, you would do the deeds. You don't do the deeds of your father. You do the deeds of your father, the devil, who is a murderer and a liar and the father of lies. Jesus probably would not be invited, and you know that. I don't know that he would come and, anyway, I think he's a lot more serious than we give him credit. He said, you're of your father, the devil. You're not of Abraham. And Galatians talks about those who are of faith are of believing Abraham. Abraham believed. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. The sons of Abraham are those who have come to him through faith. Anyway, you read all that, it talks about there was another gospel, different, which means they are offering different Jesuses. How I many of you knew there are different Jesuses? You better find the true one. The true one is the way, the truth, and the life. The others are not the way, they lead you another way through legalism, through works, through, you know, something. Man, you know, man becoming God. There's a lot of that. Can I announce it's even around this region? 
Instead of Jesus getting on the, becoming the increase and man decrease, that's been flipped around. Man is on the increase, Jesus gets decreased. That's a false gospel. It is a false, and we're going to call it out. You better find the real. Anyway, you can read the whole book of Galat- Galatians. It's an incredible book. It's an apostolic book. You remember I shared last week that in the medical field today, although there are more and more all over the earth physicians standing up and speaking the truth. Have you seen them? Many. You may only see them once because they get silenced. They get censored. It's just like I saw, and I knew about the president of Tanzania, but the Ivory Coast, Haiti, and there are other places in Africa, Madagascar, or somewhere, they tried to assassinate him. But if you do not bow to the mandates that are now being distributed by our own administration, you will pay the ultimate price. And so they just eliminated those presidents. But anyway, I'm glad the God, you know, that in the medical field, they used to say you could have a second opinion. Today, you better not have a second opinion about some things. No, you can have a second opinion, especially if your opinion is the antichrist opinion, the opposite of what God has said is true and what he's doing. You know, we're battling against some of that Antichrist stuff, don't you? The anti means just the opposite. If you find the opposite of, guess what you've found? Anti. Anyway, you used to have a second opinion. You don't get one anymore. But in the gospel, you don't get a second opinion. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Period. You don't get, well, I got another way. No other way. We're not going to censor you. We're just going to tell the way. Well, there's so many things you could go in there. So, number one, if Christ is preached. So, we're going to preach Christ. Say, we're going to preach Christ. Secondly, chapter 15. I'm not going to read it all. You read it later. But look in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that there has been, that he has been raised from the dead. But some of you say there's no resurrection, there's no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain. In other words, the apostolic gospel is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people believe in reincarnation. I preach in Africa every week, and I know there are those who believe in reincarnation. We do not believe in reincarnation, we believe in the resurrection. Jesus has been raised. It's what separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. Their so-called follower, whoever it is, their master's dead. Our God is alive. He's alive and he's living. Now, when you look at the resurrection, there's his resurrection, right? We're not going to back off of that. That's the power, the power of the resurrection. But then there's our resurrection. Our resurrection means we must be willing to die. Did you hear what I said? Paul said, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. Okay? Read the rest of the story. And the fellowship of his sufferings. He that suffers with him will also reign with him. If you deny me before men, I will deny you. Before my Father, which is in heaven. I do not want to look into his eyes and see him say, I never knew you. To those who believed, they knew him. Do you think it's true? According to the Bible. Now, there's different forms of the American gospel that would not agree with that. Paul said, what things were gained to me, I've counted as loss for Christ. I indeed count all things as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Say all things. All things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. You know, we said earlier about Jim Elliott. Jim, that 
28-year-old missionary that wanted to bring the gospel and lost his life on that sandbar in Ecuador being speared to death by the tribe he's trying to reach. And then after his wife goes and brings the gospel to the tribe that murdered her husband. They found in his journal, he'd written this before his death. It's no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so it is in this hour. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead. Romans 6, 8. And then, for if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And then the third aspect of the apostolic gospel, it's about possessing a genuine faith. Look in verse 17. If Christ is not risen, your faith is what? Feudal. And you're still in your sin. Feudal. Feudal means this. Listen, a few more minutes. Idle. Deceptive. Useless. Fruitless. Corrupt. Perverted. Superstition. Now, some people do have a superstition. We don't have a superstition. We have a a supernatural God. And it's a supernatural faith. And it's not always in what we see. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things we may never have seen. But we believe God's word regardless of what we've seen. It's God's word that we believe. And our faith is not futile. Our faith is genuine. I believe that faith is going to be shaken. Many who said they had faith in this hour, it will become known in the months, probably days, years I do not know. I know it will be proven that they had no faith whatsoever. They had faith in faith. They had faith in a doctrine. They had faith in a religion. They had no faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It was futile. This is why he says, look back at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. Verse 1 of chapter 15 which I preach to you, which also you receive, say receive, and in which you stand, by which you are saved. So you receive the gospel, you stand, you stand, you make your stand, your claim, I will never deny him. I will not comply. I will not bow to the idols. Of men, I stand. And then what does it say? By which you are also what? Saved. It's a different way to look at that, isn't it? Because we know salvation is a gift, grace. But faith without works is absolutely dead. Dead. And I tell you, there are many in America... It will be known their faith was dead all the time. And others are going to rise up because it says, if you hold by which you're also saved, if you hold fast that word, the word of God which I preach to you, unless you had believed in vain. Did you hear me? Does that make sense? You guys still with me? Nobody's falling asleep. I'm just looking around real quick. We'll come and send. No, Jerry's preaching in Indiana, so I will send Jay and Ray, and they'll come wake you up. Do you think it makes any sense? Jesus said, When I return, will I find faith in the earth? How many of you are determined? He will. I'm determined. We're determined. He will. And then another thing about the apostolic gospel, and it really was said in verse 17, it's about the forgiveness of sin. Verse 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. We proclaim forgiveness. I found that when I preach on forgiveness in Uganda, it's like that's what draws the greatest. I mean, that's where there's great conviction. I heard somebody say, you know, and we follow them people or we run into them every day. Everybody in America, it seems today, is carrying around a load of guilt. 
They've got guilt. They, they carry this load of guilt. Do you know why people feel guilty today? Because they're guilty. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all guilty. There's none righteous, no, not one. So we come to him by faith. He who knew no sin becomes sin for us, that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we confess, we receive the mercies of God. His mercies are new every morning. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I'm telling you, even the most hardened criminal politician, I'm trying to be nice. I don't care who you are. You can be forgiven. But you got to come his way. You got to come the way of the cross. There's no other way. The blood of Jesus is enough. The blood of Jesus will protect you. Don't deny the blood of Jesus. Don't make a public spectacle of his blood. Did he say you would drink any deadly thing and it will not harm you? Or did he not say? If you believe he did not say, then run to the world. If you believe he said it, then run to him. Choose ye this day who you're going to serve. If you name the name of Christ, depart from inequity. That's what Timothy said. Don't dare claim his name. And you live in the world. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. If you think the world has what you need to bring salvation, then keep running to the world. Because your world's about to run out. But those who run to Christ, the riches of His grace, the magnificence of His splendor, the mercies of God, the love of God, nothing will separate me. Persecution, hatred, all this stuff goes on and on. We could stay there all day. But God offers forgiveness. And then the apostolic gospel is about Christ and his coming. Verse 23. You guys, I didn't keep my 20, 25 minutes, but it's okay, right? I'll be done quickly. It doesn't matter. I lost my appetite. Look in verse 23. I found the real food. Jesus said, I'm not hungry. I got something that fulfills me. You don't even know what it is. It's doing the Father's will. Verse 23, but each one, yes, verse 20, each one is in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ add his what? It's coming. In some circles, they eliminated preaching the second coming of Christ. Some of our good friends. No, what do you think? The main thing is in the book of Revelation. They're saying, even so, come. All this stuff going on, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. That means more to me now than it ever meant. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your spirit, soul, body be preserved without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus. James 5. Therefore, be patient, brethren. You saw the suffering of Job and how he endured and how there's an end intended by the Lord. But be patient until the coming of the Lord. You don't give up until that day. Acts 1, they looked, you know, said, why are you stirring? Why are you staring up into heaven? Don't you know this same Jesus who was brought to you will so come in like manner? He's going to come and every eye will see him. Revelation 22, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. To render to every man according to what he has done. And behold, he is coming, Revelation 1, 7, with clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And so it is to be. Amen. Matthew 24, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know the day. And so we're to preach. I know man wants to build the kingdom, and it's a worthy task. But let me tell you, the kingdom of God is built by the king himself. And he's going to use us. But we got to get back to preaching his coming. 
That's the hope. If you're facing the death squad, what's your kingdom message going to do any good? Except that that's where they're going. I understand that. But they also know that Christ is coming to put an end to all of this. Christ is coming to reign. And there's hope. The blessed hope. Jesus is coming again. And he's going to judge the living and the dead. Every man will stand before him at his appearing. They will give an account of what they did in this life. we got to tell people you're going to give an account. You reject him now. You will not reject him then. He will reject you. And all of those that denied his name before men. The apostolic gospel is not about what's only coming to an end, though. It is about what is to begin, verse 24. Then Christ, or then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, which he's put an end. He, say he. He puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Even those who rose up with a fake authority and a fake authority and a fake power. Your authority is coming to an end. When the ultimate king comes. There'll be a definite end, but they also, this is not about coming to an end. This is about what's just getting to begin. It's what we've been waiting for, the kingdom age. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. Then the apostolic gospel is about his reign, verse 25 and verse 26. And he shall reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that he shall destroy is what? Death. Death. You go have your body frozen if you want to. I don't know how they stole the brains. What do they have, a different container for brains? This is young Frankenstein. It's absolutely crazy. Man, I bet Rodney's having a fun, good time down in Tampa with this too. I didn't know such exists. I thought it was only science fiction. I'm just telling you, he's going to put an end. It's an end. It's going to be over. There'll be a day you're going to see a great the end. But the reign of Christ will have just begun. It's been happening all along. That's what the kingdom is right now in us anyway. But it's, it's going to be on public display. And then the last thing, the apostolic gospel is about God being all in all. Verse 28, and then I am done. But when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to the Father, to him, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. This story ends well. It's better than well. Far better than we can imagine. So let me pray and just release this faith. You need this faith and this apostolic gospel. This apostolic message, Jesus.